Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church on this All Saints Sunday. Did I hear some amens and hallelujahs out here? There we go. Would you please stand with us in body or in spirit? You know, this morning, as we gather on All Saints, I'm just... We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, right? There are those who have gone before us. And what that means for us is that we step into a world created by folks who cared about the love of God. And so we have a world with beautiful institutions and hospitals and, and um, schools. And, and we're growing up in a world where we have equal rights to a degree, you know. <laughs> Um, so many amazing things that we enjoy because of this great cloud of witnesses. Let us not today imagine that the freedom that they brought was only a spiritual freedom, but a freedom that they worked hard for because they cared about the love of God. And uh, we're going to sing about that this morning. We've been doing this song... And I'm just so happy to sing it with you again this morning. It all comes down to this. What you require of me. Love my neighbor as myself. And you above all things. So I just sing. Love mercy. Walk on. freedom that we all know love we're going to sing about that now you came to set the captives free Every 
Today's reading is from Acts chapter 8. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him 
because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandig, which means queen of the e Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you were reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
and he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Would you rise with us? And as you rise, can you just say in your heart, thank you, Jesus.
Remain standing with me. We are in the portion of the liturgical movement of the service where we gather. Did you know that? We gather in the presence of the Lord as a community and we recognize that God is in our presence. Amen? Amen. And we call out to God and we praise God, which is what we've been doing. Thanks be to God. But there's not only the liturgical moment here in the service, but there's also what's called the liturgical calendar. And today is All Saints Day. Did you know that? Around the world, our brothers and sisters in Christ are celebrating All Saints Day. It's a moment to pause and recognize the saints who have gone before us. As Pastor Joe would say, not just the famous ones, but your grandmas and grandpas, your moms and dads, those Sunday school teachers who led you who have passed away. Of course, the great saints, the apostles, 
But it's a time for us to remember that we are part of something older and wiser and longer and bigger than just us. And so what we're going to do today is we are going to, in honor of that day, this day, we are going to say the Apostles' Creed together. Now the Apostles' Creed is a symbol of faith. We're going to have it up on the screen for you. The Apostles' Creed is a symbol of faith which has been around for a long time, at least the 5th century, if not before. It has been used by many, many, many groups in the Christian tradition. In fact, there is an apocryphal story that maybe each one of the apostles wrote one of the statements of faith in the Apostles' Creed. We don't know that that's true, but it's kind of cool, right? It has been used in so many different denominations, including the United Methodists. It's in their hymnal, a hymnal that is connected with John and Charles Wesley, our great-grandfathers of the faith. And so they believed it was important to come together and say the Apostles' Creed together. It's a symbol of a faith. It's a way that we say this is what we believe. It's not all that we believe. If you read carefully, you'll notice there's some things not in the Apostles' Creed. But it's a chance for us to come together and remember with all the saints who've gone before us what we stand for, what we believe. And so I invite you this morning in a moment to say this with me and follow along with me. We're all going to say it together. And if you can't say it all or you don't feel it quite yet, let the rest of us carry you this morning. Is that all right? And we'll be the body of Christ. Let's read this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended in heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. And now we go as we continue to gather to a moment of prayer. If you're with us uh, for some time, you know how we do this. This is an important part of our service. If you'd like to come and be anointed for healing uh, with oil, you can come down here to your left, and a pastor or prayer team member will come and meet you, pray for you. You can come and, and stand in the place of someone who might not be here today. For all sorts of healing, we invite you. If you'd like to come and spend some time alone with the Lord, praying, praising, worshiping. You can come down here to your right. A pastor or prayer team member may come by and just touch you on the shoulder. We're not going to interrupt you unless you invite us into your prayer time. So I invite you to have a seat this morning and come forward and pray as we sing this beautiful chorus together. Give me eyes to see and ears to hear If you're speaking, Lord Make it loud and clear If you want to move Let us go from here Give me eyes to see and ears to hear Give me eyes Give me eyes to see And ears to hear If you're speaking, Lord Make it loud and clear if you want to move, let us go from here. Give me eyes to see and ears to hear. Give me eyes to see and ears to hear. Give me eyes to see and ears to hear. Pray with me this morning, whether you're here in the sanctuary or online with us worshiping this morning. Father God, we as always want to begin with praise to you. As we have gathered your body of Christ, your current saints, we want to give thanks for all the saints that have come before us. We remember those people that perhaps led us to Christ or discipled us or who have been important mentors in our lives, our, our parents, our grandparents, those Sunday school teachers, those pastors, those great saints of the church, those authors who have opened the scriptures to us in powerful ways. Lord, this morning we remember them and we give thanks for them. 
Lord, continue to use them to shape and form us into the very image and likeness of Jesus. Father God, we come together as a worshiping body and you have taught us to lift our concerns. You, you said if, if anyone is ill, the elders should gather and anoint them with oil. So I pray for these people down here on my right this morning. May you meet them in the particular place they are. Touch them with physical healing, emotional healing, relational healing, financial healing, whatever it is that they need from you today. Dear God, we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ that you will meet them. For we are people who still believe that you move in this world. Father God, our eyes, of course, want to be open. Our ears want to be open. We, we want to see beyond ourselves, so we lift up the needs of the world. All over, all over the world, even in the last few weeks, there have been stadiums that have, have crushed people. There have been, there have been uh, 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 celebrations where people have been run over and killed. There have been floods and there have been bridges that have collapsed. And there's been people who've been trying to escape war torn areas of the world. And there's people who are trying to get out of sex trafficking. And there's so much need around the world. We are so thankful that you've sent your missionaries and your people into those places. But Lord, we send our prayers into those places as well. May you support those on the ground who are ministering and caring. May we write our checks and may we send our notes and may we lift up our prayers. May we somehow find a way that, to be part of these needs, both in our local neighborhoods and around the world. We're so grateful, Father God, for all that you do in our lives, all the ways that you minister to us all the ways that you touch us, all the ways that you challenge us. Even today, Lord, I pray anointing over Pastor Joe as he opens this passage of Scripture to us. And I do pray fervently that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. May we be troubled in all the right ways. May we be encouraged in all the right ways. May we be disturbed in ways that will move us out into the world to literally be the body of Christ, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Lord, forgive us for holding you to ourselves, keeping you to ourselves. Forgive us for making religion individual and private. Oh, Father God, you chose Israel to be the nation that would bring all people to you. And now you have chosen your church to be the means to bring all people to you. So, Lord, this isn't ours. It's yours. And so today we remember that. And we bring our gifts, our talents we bring our little lights that sometimes feel like they're about to flicker out. We bring them to you today knowing that you will empower us by the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us. You can bring healing and restoration and reconciliation across political divides, across broken marriages, across estranged families. For God, what we share is you. What we share is you and your love for each one of your children who are made in the very image of God. So we need your help, Father God. We need it so desperately. And that is why we come together and pray this prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Pray this with me this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And all God's children said, amen, amen. Thank you for praying with me, friends, this morning. We are so happy and glad that you are here with us. We want to invite the children to take off and have an amazing time in Children's Church with Pastor Ch Jasmine and crew. And I want to invite the rest of you to stand this morning, pass the peace of Christ to someone, say hello, get a name, give a name.
let me invite you to return to your seats and have a seat. I never know how long to let you all go. I think you'd go all afternoon if I let you. But we got a lot more good stuff to do together as the body of Christ, so please take your seat. I have just a few announcements to bring to your attention. Remember, your worship folder has everything you need to know. So make sure you look at that carefully. We don't print this just to be fans. We want you to read these and look at them. But I will mention a couple things. We know that Veterans Week is beginning this week. And next Sunday, we will acknowledge veterans uh, here at the, in, uh, in, in the church service. I do want to mention something new that's been going that's exciting is the College Aging Adults uh, college and Young Adults Ministry that happens on Sunday night. If you or someone you know fits that category, please look that up and become a part of that. I've been told that there is a blood drive going on and they are open to walk-ins. In California, we are always behind on blood. So if you haven't signed up but you have time this afternoon to go and give blood, we encourage you to do that. Another uh, exciting thing is that we're selling C's candy here at church. Always an exciting thing. But what's more exciting is why we're selling it. And it goes for our youth, our, um, our youth group that is headed to Nazarene Youth International uh, coming this summer. Some, anybody gone to Nazarene Youth International? Raise your hand if you have. A few, right. Okay, excellent. I went. I sent my kids on it. It is a life-changing experience. It's a wonderful experience for Nazarene youth to get together with other Nazarene youth all over the United States and different parts of the world. And they just have a wonderful time. They're encouraged. They're excited. It's wonderful to see other kids who are worshiping the Lord and growing in their faith from other parts of, this, of the nation. And it costs a good amount of money to go to that. So we are selling C's candy to support them to go on that trip. Okay, so right out here under one of the tents, you'll find a place where you can sign up for C's Candy. Who doesn't like C's Candy? Get it for your friends. Use it for Christmas. I know it's a little bit early. Put it in the freezer. I don't know how that works. If there's people in your community or at work you know love C's Candy, you could buy for them, right? So all sorts of ways that we can support our youth in that. And this is a really powerful experience, so we really do encourage you to do that. If you're worshiping with us the first time, we are so happy to have you. There are in your pew racks there some cards. We'd love to have you fill out. Let us know you were here. There's a, you can do it by hand or there's a QR card. You can do it, a QR code. You can do it online. Um, we'd love to know that you're here. Or if you need to communicate with the pastoral staff about something, going on in your life, a prayer request, someone who's in need of a visit, that is also a wonderful way to communicate with us. So those are right there in the pew rack in front of you. Lastly, as always, we want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. We don't pass the offering plates anymore, but you have been faithful and the Lord is faithful. Amen? The Lord is faithful, and then we are faithful. <laughs> That's probably the way it should go. And we have boxes all over the sanctuary. We invite you to put um, your offering in there, or you can give online. You can text. You can, you can do it through the website. You can mail things in. There's many different ways to do that. We thank you again for your faithfulness to God's faithfulness so that we can continue to be faithful as the body of Christ. I'm going to stop now because a couple weeks ago I got played right off the stage. Do you remember that? A video started and I wasn't done. I wasn't hurt at all. Friends, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And may God bless the preaching of the word. Good morning. It is great to see you. It is great to be together in the house of the Lord. Amen. I am grateful that we have taken the time the last two Sundays to read lengthy passages of Scripture. In these three weeks in the book of Acts, We've been reading full chapters, and next Sunday we'll do the same. In part because we want to take care that we get 
the sweeping panorama of the movement of God's spirit. Last week in Acts chapter two, you know, usually the preacher preaches one section of that. And last week we read the entire chapter and many of you commented how thankful you were to hear all of that chapter. And again today we come to Acts chapter eight and we, we had it read for us all 40 verses. And as I have been reading these chapters in preparation for these messages, it has prompted a recollection of my own history, my own faith history of the saints in my family and the saints in my life who've gone before me. Of those who followed Christ before me and who shared that life with me in so many ways. I am fortunate to have been raised in a home of faith. I'm fortunate that I came and come from a long line of faithful people. I'm thankful for others in the churches that I grew up in who lived it before me, who whispered wisdom to me, even as a child, corrective wisdom. I'm thankful for the pastor who invited an usher to sit with me and a friend in the back row of the sanctuary one day. because two boys were being boys. But to teach respect. I'm thankful for an elderly retired woman in the congregation I was a part of in high school who came to me in my senior year of high school and said, I understand you're going to go to Pasadena College understand you are called to be a pastor. And in 1970, she said, I'm going to send you $100 a month this year to help you. I don't know what that equates to today. But she took from her small income and birthed hope and a young man whose family had said, we don't know how you'll go to college, we have no money. But God's provision is the witness of the Spirit in my life. Not all of us in this sanctuary today come from a lineage of faith. Some of us have come to faith at a different place in life, and you may be the first person in your family to be a person of faith. but you have a lineage of faith. Those whom God has brought alongside of you in your journey of life that awakened in you that desire, that sparked in you some kind of sense that God had something for you, and you came to that moment of saying, I will follow. And so you have had people in your life who have modeled for you what it means. And so you have spiritual fathers and mothers and grandfathers and grandmothers. And so say thanks be to God for that witness. And on All Saints Sunday, how fitting it is that we are in Acts and we see the sweep of God's movement through the Holy Spirit, touching the lives of people, changing the lives of people, correcting people, and doing what God does so well. Making people aware of God's provision and hope and grace and mercy in their lives.
And so it is on this day. We come to say thanks be to God for those who've gone before us. And as Pastor Brad says, not just those who are famous, for there are billions of believers who are not famous who are just simply faithful. And when called by the Spirit of God to do something, they did that, such as give $100 to a wannabe preacher. Or like my grandfather, who was named after me. <laughs> Pastored small churches in places most of us never heard about, but cared for people and the people of God in places that many have forgotten. And yet God sent a man to a place like that. And God provided for that man. And so it is as we come to this passage this morning, all 40 verses of it. The reading of chapter eight introduced us to Philip and Simon and Peter and John and an unnamed man from Africa. It also introduces us to the rapidly expanding geography of the young church. And if we were to look back, chapter seven, and I really encourage you to go back and read chapter seven. In fact, go on back to six. In fact, it's even better if you start with chapter one and read all the way through. <laughs> but chapter seven is a remarkable story of Stephen and his witness of the gospel and those who conspired against him to bring him to trial under false charges of blasphemy and his sermon, his sermon that recites the history of God and God's people and their engagement with one another and how God called Abraham out to go to a place he'd never seen or been to, and how God called the people out of Egypt through a man named Moses, and how God did all of these things, and how often the people persecuted the messengers of God, killed the messengers of God, and as a stiff-necked people resisted the work of God. And Stephen's sermon before the Sanhedrin so angers them in their attempts to preserve the religious system of their day and its political acquaintances with the Roman Empire and they get so angry they lose their minds and they drag him out into the street and stone him to death. And Stephen says, Oh God, don't hold this against them. The words of Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so it is that that begins the diaspora of the church and they scatter. And in the very first line of chapter eight, we're told that Saul was present and approving. And so it is that the horror of chapter seven marks the beginning of the church in Jerusalem and serves to disperse the believers, which is illustrated by the ministry of Philip. Philip was one of the seven. If you go back to chapter six, you remember the apostle said, there's so many things going on, we don't have time to do everything. And so all of you believers get together and elect seven who will care for the daily needs of the people. And F Stephen and Philip were one of those seven. 
with Stephen's martyrdom, they are now six. And they are scattered, and Philip is scattered. And so it is that the story begins to unfold. And if you go on into chapter 9, you will read the rest of Saul's story. Because what he approved in the first line of chapter 8 without recognizing that he became the unwitting tool of God. The very thing that Saul had hoped to stop from growing grew because of Saul and the persecution he led. And so it was that Saul is unwittingly used of God and his presence at Stephen's stoning becomes the fertile soil for what would happen in chapter nine. What we wanna recognize in the sweep of these opening verses of chapter eight is that the Holy Spirit of God is at work even among those we may not recognize as at work. That even in the most hardened of persons, the Spirit of God may be at work even among those who may work against us, the Spirit of God may be at work. And if you read through Paul's letter late, later, he talks about his lineage. He talks about the burden that he bears because of what he had done. And so it is that the Spirit of God is already at work in the life of a man named Saul, who would become perhaps the most traveled missionary in the early church. When Joan and I were recently in ancient Corinth, our guide said to us, it is recorded that, Saul traveled, or that Paul traveled 13,000 miles. Remarkable. The Spirit of God is at work. The other insight that I would suggest to you from these opening verses is that God can and will use the acts of non-believers to further the kingdom. We sometimes think it's all on us. It's on anyone God touches to assist us. And I will take assistance from a non-believer. For many of them have a heart for what God is doing. And they believe in all of the things of God in a way that maybe is not yet to fruition in their lives. I said this morning, as we gathered before service with the worship team and the tech team and the pastoral team, and I encouraged us to be a teaching church because we tend to assume when we come into the church that everybody is at the same place we are and everybody knows what we know. Well, it's not true. We're all at a different place on the journey. I mean, you heard Pastor Brad before we read the Apostles' Creed. It's okay that if at some point in this you find yourself not agreeing with this, it's okay because we want you to come to that place when the Spirit brings you to that place. We want the Spirit to help resolve those questions in your mind and you arrive at those places of decision under the Spirit's guidance rather than our insistence. I'm more interested in bringing people along the journey of faith as the Holy Spirit guides them than I am insisting that they get a certificate of completion. And so it is we find ourselves in this movement of the Spirit of God in Acts chapter eight. In Acts chapter eight, verses four to eight, Philip becomes the first identified missionary and goes to Samaria. Think about the movement of God here. Where does Philip go? He goes to the Samaritans, the most hated, despised group 
of somewhat related people to the Jews that the Jews can imagine. The Samaritans in Samaria where Jesus spoke to the woman at the well. The Samaritans that are the the ground zero for the parable from Jesus of the Good Samaritan. And there's a thing going on here in the young church. Because Samaritans, because of their close alignment with the Jews ethnically, are not considered Gentiles. And so here's Philip in Samaria. The Spirit of God takes the missionary to the place of people most closely aligned with the Jews by ethnicity and who are most deeply despised. And the Spirit of God begins to break down the walls of deeply held beliefs. And people believe, and they're converted. This act of the Holy Spirit in Philip's life is the quintessential definition of love thy neighbor. There's no magic, there's no spiritual vitality, there's no great thing to give witness to in loving your neighbor who's like, who likes you and is like you. Love thy neighbor, as the scripture calls out to us, is to love those unlike us, most unlike us, who challenge us, who are challenging to us, and who we say, you know, I really don't wanna be in that person's presence. Well, maybe God wants you to be in that person's presence. And so it is that Philip is there in this place and many Samaritans believe and were baptized. And beginning in verse nine, we, we encounter one of the first known challenges of the church because we run into Simon the magician. He was practicing sorcery and many people were amazed at what he did and he practiced magic to his own gain. He was part self-promoter, part sorcerer, part marketing genius, genius who became known as the great power. But then Philip comes with the gospel and people begin to believe and be baptized. And Simon is amazed by the miracles he sees. And Simon believes and is baptized. Go figure that one out. And from time to time, we hear of accounts of great personalities being led to Christ. Kanye West. Now there's a character. Claims to be a Christian, holds revival services, makes anti-Semitic statements. And 1 John chapter four says to us, test the spirits, you will know them by their fruit. And that's exactly what happens here with Simon. For the fruit of Simon's life accrues to him, but the fruit of Philip's life accrues to God. There's a question, before you follow the rabbit trail of a proclamation of someone following Christ, you'll see where the fruit accrues to. It's the point of discernment for us. It's the way that we discern because if you go down and would create a chart, both Philip and Simon draw crowds. Both Philip and Simon do powerful things. But Simon draws people to himself and Philip draws people to Jesus. There's a promoter about Simon and there's a humility about Philip. And so it is that we take care with our discernment. 
And then in verse 14, we have this interlude in the story of Simon. For Peter and John are sent from Jerusalem because they've heard about the conversions of the Samaritans, and so the folks in Jerusalem say, you need to go down there and make sure this is authentic. Little bit of that Samaritan resistance on the part of the Jews. So Peter and John go down there, they go to Samaria, and they find their conversion authentic. And so they don't reconvert them, they don't rebaptize them, but they bring the gift of the Holy Spirit to them and anoint them with the Holy Spirit. And so they authenticate the work of conversion among the Samaritans. But then we return to the story of Simon. And Simon watches Peter and John and Philip and what they're doing. And when Peter and John are baptizing folks with the Holy Spirit, Simon says, hey, I want that. How much do I have to pay? See, what Simon has done is what we today call syncretism. He had taken one set of beliefs and melded it with his own set of beliefs, trying to make something different. And Peter rebukes him and says, this is a gift from God, you can't buy this. Only God gives this. And Simon, so terrified, says, oh, pr please pray that what you have rebuked me with doesn't happen to me. And as often happens in scripture, the scripture account leaves the question open whether or not Simon was really eventually completely converted. You know, there's that open question at the end of the parable of the prodigal son about the older son. There's an open question here about Simon. And then after this, the Holy Spirit says to Philip, beginning in verse 26, go down to the road that goes south from Jerusalem toward Gaza, walk there, and you'll find a man. Here's the Holy Spirit at work, directing. And Philip goes, and on that road, he hears a man reading the scroll of Isaiah, an Ethiopian eunuch who is the treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia named Candace. And he is there reading, and Simon says, do you understand what you read? And he's reading the prophecy about Jesus. How can I understand if no one will teach me? And so Philip climbs in the chariot, tells him about Jesus, the Christ, and the gospel of Jesus, and he's converted. And so here is this man who believes, and they're going along, and the Ethiopian says, there's water, any reason I can't be baptized? Now this is really important, folks, because the Ethiopian had presented Philip with a problem. Because the practice in Jerusalem was that you could only be baptized if you believed in Christ and you were, you were circumcised first. <coughs> and Philip says, no, come on, let's go. And he breaks all of the convention of baptism at that time and baptizes. You know, sometimes, folks, we create structures that are a hindrance to the work of God. Philip doesn't get stuck in the hindrances of the structures. And in fact, next week, we're gonna talk about the Council of Jerusalem where this is the central issue in the council. Do Gentiles who believe have to be circumcised? There's a whole lot of things that go on there and the Holy Spirit is at work. But here is this man. He is the first Gentile to be baptized this Ethiopian official. And so what has now happened in chapter eight? 
The Holy Spirit has taken the gospel to Samaria and now the Holy Spirit has come upon an Ethiopian and African and the gospel is gonna go where? Into Africa now. You get the picture? The Holy Spirit is at work. The Holy Spirit is moving. And the official's conversion begins a series of historically significant conversion stories that follow. Saul in chapter nine, who becomes Paul. Cornelius in chapter 10 and on. The gospel is going places where no one in Jerusalem ever thought it would go because God, under the work of his Holy Spirit, said, this can't stay here, it's gotta go there. We see in practice what we saw last week, that the work of God in the lives of persons occur so that God may be at work to create a people. And God is creating a new people, and what God is doing is extending, as we said last week, the covenant to Abraham, the covenant through Moses, the covenant to Israel, the covenant to David, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and now the covenant of God is dispersed throughout the world, the nations. And grace and mercy abounds. Chapter eight is the story of the Holy Spirit baptizing persons and creating a people, a diverse people, a people not seen before, a people of God that is from all nations, tribes, and languages, which is the vision of Revelation chapter nine, verse seven. Would you hear this, please? The vision of God for the work of God is not limited by our vision of God for the work of God. The vision of God for the work of God is not limited by our vision for the work of God. Because we have these limitations, we have these structures, we have these things that we think are important. I grew up in the Church of the Nazarene in a season when there were all the rules. The rules. Some of y'all grew up with me in the Church of the Nazarene and had the rules. You took a nap on Sunday, that was a rule. I hated that rule as a 10 year old kid. Today I love that rule. You didn't read the newspaper on Sunday. I mean, there's just a whole list of stuff, legalistic stuff. The question isn't, what are the rules? The question is, what is God doing and how do I participate? Go there. Going there will make some of us uncomfortable going there go there. I titled this sermon Magic and Miracles, the difference between the magic of Simon and the miracles that Philip was a part of. But there were a lot of miracles being done, but here's what I think the miracle of chapter eight is. The miracle of chapter eight is the Holy Spirit helped these people love their neighbors. And every once in a while I hear conversation, well why, why don't miracles still happen today like they used to happen? You know friends, I will tell you, if you wanna be a miracle, love your neighbor. You wanna participate in a miracle today? Love your neighbor. When we love our neighbor in the way God asks us to love our neighbor, miracles happen. And they happen here first, in the interior place first. In just a moment, we're gonna come and share in the sacrament of communion, and we're gonna serve it to you today. We're gonna do away with the crazy cups and lids and all that stuff. How about that? But think about it. 
Isn't that what this table means? That Jesus came and loved his neighbors. It cost him his life. And when you come today to receive the bread and the cup, let it be a call to participate in modern day miracle working by loving our neighbors. Different than you, frustrating to you. They've already captured your heart because you think about them. Right? If they're going to own your heart and mind, let's own it for a miraculous purpose and let God do a new work. I've asked Pastor Brad to come and to provide for us the institution of the elements as we prepare to receive the bread and the cup. There's two movements in the taking of the Lord's Supper. The first is the blessing or the institution, which I'll pray. And then the second movement is the taking of it together. So I invite you this morning to join with me in the institution. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, friends, he took the bread among his closest and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you take this, do so in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your broken body. We're thankful for what it means for us as individuals, but we're thankful for what it means for us as the body of Christ. And that as you were broken and poured out, you now invite us, no, command us also to be broken and poured out for the sake of the world. After supper, he took the cup He said, this is my blood, blood of the new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you take this, do so in remembrance of me. Heavenly God, once again, we are awestruck that you are mindful of us. That your love is so powerful, so amazing, so cutting through all the junk that we put in the way, that you would give your life for us. Yes, to forgive us of our sins, but yes, also to show us a model of morality, a model of loving our neighbors as ourselves. May we love our neighbors as you have loved us. Thanks, God, for your blood poured out for us. You do not have to be a member of this church to receive the sacrament in this church. We encourage all who are following Christ, at whatever stage you are in that following, to come and receive the body and blood of Jesus. And so you are welcome here today. This morning we're going to serve you in a way that we believe fits this season of life in the church and the community. We have several stations around the sanctuary. And so with a gloved hand, someone will hand you a wafer and say to you, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Take it and eat it. I want you to take it and eat it right then. And someone else with a gloved hand will hand you a cup of juice from a communion tray. You remember those cups like we used to do? They're back. You don't have to peel it. And they will say to you, this is my blood shed for you. This is blood of Jesus shed for you. Take it and drink it and drink it then. And so to avoid mass confusion, You need to do exactly as I tell you. (laughs) All right? Those of you seated in the two side sections, I want you to go out to the aisle by the wall 
walk down to the front and there are station on each side where our pastoral friends and helpers will assist you with that. And then return to your seat by the interior aisle. Those of you seated in the center sections, I want you to come to the center aisle and come forward, receive the elements from one of the two stations here, and then return to your seat by the interior aisle. So that means everybody's gonna be going back to their seat in the same two aisles. All right, center section coming here, two side sections going to the outer wall, going down to the front. We have a station in the back of the sanctuary and one in the balcony. And so I know that there are those among us who find it difficult to walk down the slope and walk back. I fully appreciate that. My day is coming. It's okay. Pastor Donovan and Pastor Saltiel will serve you in the back. I also know that there are some of us who cannot walk to any of these stations. And so we will come to you And so as we get close to finishing the service at the front stations, I will ask you, if you would like to be served in your seat, raise your hand and someone will come to you and serve you. Be patient. Let these moments be sweet and sacred for us. Let them be blessed as you receive the bread and the cup in a more personal way. And to those of you at home, I wish you were here. I wish you could be here. We'd love to serve you. And we long for that day when that may be possible for you. But we hope you can share in these moments at home as best you can. All right? I invite you to come. Come to receive as you will bread in the cup.
like someone to serve you and Take see where you are. We will come to you. Keep your hand raised. Let her pray shed for you. Take a drink. Thank you, Pastor Marshall. Anyone else, let us know by an uplifted hand. Where? Okay. Thank you. They're coming. Thank you. Anyone else would like to be served? Has everyone been served? What sweet moments. Thanks be to God. May this bread and may this cup be the gift of God to you on this day. And may the Holy Spirit rest upon you and go with you and may you be a miracle and love your neighbor. And everyone said, amen, you are dismissed.